हेलो स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम टू ईपीजी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर एम एन गुप्ता एमेरिटस प्रोफेसर फ्रॉम आईआईटी दिल्ली टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू टॉक ऑन मॉड्यूल एंटाइटल्ड हिस्ट्री ऑफ इम्यूनोलॉजी फ्रॉम द पेपर कॉल्ड इम्यूनोलॉजी द ऑब्जेक्टिव्स ऑफ दिस मॉड्यूल आर टू स्टडी द वेरियस माइल in the development of immunology to understand how the immune system distinguishes between self and non self we will also see the various nobel prizes awarded in this area over the years what is immunology immunology is the science aiming to understand how vertebrates which are credited with having an immune system distinguish between self and non self furthermore the immune system is able to recall that a previous encounter with a particular pathogen has taken place without having any clue beforehand about the nature of an infection the immune system is able to mount a very efficient response to this infection if this ability to distinguish between self and non self of the immune system is impaired it has serious consequences and results in what are called autoimmune diseases the ability to distinguish between self and non self has consequences in many familiar context we all know that the blood transfusion requires blood group matching we also know that an organ transplant like that of a heart or kidney requires some matching so self and non self has to be interpreted in terms of how different we are immunologically in this introductory chapter we'll also try to learn about what constitutes this immunological identity the second key element of the immune system as we had pointed out is sort of a memory to recall that a particular infection has been encountered before almost towards the end of this course we will learn that this memory feature is the basis of the vaccine developments the concepts which will be covered in this particular module mostly relates to the contributions by the various scientists in this area Frank Estero, Jenner, Pascher, Metchnikoff, Ehrlich, Landsteiner, Linus Pauling, Sir Burnett. These are all well-known scientists who contributed so much to this particular subject area. Let us go way back into the history. Is shown. in this slide girolamo francastero was a contemporary of the copernicus at the university of padua girolamo francastero gave the concept of contagion as early as 1546 contagion according to the brilliant conclusion by him were too small to be visible to the naked eye but were responsible for the disease which spreads in a community it was later that the idea was taken up by others you also see here the university of padua in those days when in the days of the geralemo francastero the same university of padua also is shown in more recent times this 
move over to another part of the world. In fact, Chinese were the first ones to adopt the practice of exposing infants to the scabs from the infected individual by rubbing it in, for example, after scratching the skin or through inhalation. The Western people frowned upon such practices. We have to remember that it is the priest which also doubled up as the medical practitioner in those days. The history recalls that in 1718, Lady Mary Wortley Montague, who was the wife of the English ambassador in Constantinople, Turkey, did not listen to the advice of their priest and tried this practice with her children. It was a very wise decision because it resulted in her children being saved from a smallpox. In 1774, an English farmer, Benjamin Jesty, used cowpox instead of smallpox to variolate his children. We can see the photo of this English farmer which is available. One can also see his form in those days at Abbury. He called this practice variolate or variolation because variola in Latin means smallpox. You may wonder that why we are talking of Benjamin Jesty because many textbooks credit this practice to Jenner. Actually what happened was that the Jesty did not publish his results formally. He was just a farmer. So he is not generally credited for his discovery. Edward Jenner actually in 1798 confirmed Jesty's observation. Edward Jenner was English physician. He published his observations and hence is regarded as the father of vaccination. Again, the origin of the word vaccination is from the Latin word because veca in Latin means cow. We can see here the photo of Edward Zener and there is a quotation from him. Encouraged by his success, he wrote that I hope that someday the practice of producing cowpox in human beings will spread over the world. When that day comes, there will be no more smallpox. What actually happened was that in May 1796, Edward Jenner found a young dairy maid, Sarah Nels, who had fresh cowpox lesions on her hand and arms. On May 14, 1796, Using matter from Nelm's lesions, he inoculated an eight-year-old boy, James Phipps. Subsequently, the boy developed mild fever and discomfort in the axillae. Nine days after the procedure, he felt cold and had lost his appetite. But on the next day, he was much better. In July 1796, Jenner inoculated the boy again, this time with matter from a fresh smallpox lesion. No disease developed and Jenner concluded that the protection was complete. Much later, in 1879, Louis Pasha in France was investigating the bacteria responsible for foul cholera. Pasha brilliantly deducted that his aged culture 
worked just like Jenner's cowpox. The credit for extending this approach to other diseases like anthrax and rabies belongs to Pasteur. In present times, France has honored Pasteur because if institute at Paris retains his name, it's called Pasteur's Institute. Pasteur's Institute continues to focus on developing vaccines. In 1890, Emil von Behring and Shiba Saburo Kitasato in Berlin proposed the idea of factors in the blood called antibodies. And they said that these were responsible for the effect of vaccination. In the next few years, three key discoveries were made. Paul Ehrlich, a German chemist, showed that antibodies could protect animals against even non-bacterial toxins. Richard Pfeiffer, another German, showed that antibodies could clump and destroy Vibrio cholera, which causes cholera in humans. In 1894, Emile Rooks discovered passive immunization by transferring serum from an immunized horse against diphtheria and tetanus to protect respective patients against the two diseases. In 1893, a heat labile component was thought to be antibodies, but it later on was recognized as a complement. In 1893, 93, a Russian Ali Matshinikov showed that white blood cells of vertebrates could cause phagocytosis of some fungal spores, and he thereby started a fierce debate about humoral versus cellular agents involved in the defense against infections. The third feature also puzzled scientists quite a lot. This almost infinite capacity to come up with an antibody specific to any antigen unseen or unanticipated is a tremendous property by which immune system protects us. Finally, many times during this lecture and subsequent lectures, we will talk as if the immune system or the immune response was limited to the generation of antibodies. That in fact is not so. However, the discussion limits itself to antibody generation as historically understanding of quite a few phenomena came when we only knew about antibody response and not so much about the other complex parts of the immune response. This binding releases the receptor molecules and neutralization of the toxin continues. In his model, he also tried to explain the action of complement, which in those days was called alexane. In many ways, Ehrlich's ideas were brilliantly precinct. The triggering of B lymphocytes does involve antigen binding to Ig receptor, leading to the release of Ig immunoglobulin molecules and making more of the immunoglobulin receptors. Ehrlich also invoked cellular level picture in explaining immune responses. Around the same time, Heinz Buckner postulated that combination of antigens with serum proteins led to a specific antibody structure. This later on developed into template theory which was part of the instruction school of thought. Carl Lend Steiner, using small molecules, which were called heptanes, showed that one could produce many antibodies against any given antigen. So how does one explain unlimited number of receptors? This period of around 1920s, coincided with the rapid studies in our understanding of protein structure 
and protein chemistry. No antigens were detected in the blood. People still found merit in the template theory but were divided on whether the amino acid sequence or induced folding was responsible for the specific antibody formation. In 1940, Linus Pauling joined the debate. Pauling proposed that the terminal ends of antibody assumed a specific and complementary shape to an antigen. Pauling implied that the antibody has two combining sites for the antigen. As we will see later, he was right in his prediction, but his prediction was based upon the wrong premise. All the scientific contributions of Linus Pauling have one merit. A clear pictorial quality was inherent and so was the case in this particular area. So he sounded very convincing to many people. Burnett and Fenner around 1949, having the emerging information about the protein biosynthesis at that time, enunciated the adaptive enzyme concept according to which an animal synthesized antibody de novo in response to an antigen. The well-known Mono's operand theory, however, stated that the organism synthesized a protein at the low level but could raise this level upon the addition of a substrate. This led to Burnett later on in 1963 revisiting his ideas and proposed clonal selection theory. According to the selection concept, antibody diversity pre-exists, antigen merely selects. Paul Ehlisch proposed a side chain theory which tried to combine the role of cells and soluble factors. The side chains were supposed to be present on cell surfaces and upon blocking of these side chains, the cells responded by secreting these side chains in large numbers. We have to remember that the time at which, during which Paul Ehrlich was developing this side chain theory, we had very few tools and very little knowledge about the immune system. We have to appreciate Paul Ehrlich's brilliant vision because he turned out to be correct in several respects. So what we today call a clonal selection theory incorporated essentially the idea of these side chains on the cell surfaces. These side chains turned out to be the immunoglobulin molecules themselves and what he thought was that the cells responded by secreting these side chains in large number essentially turned out to be correct because the cell, the particular lymphocyte as we will learn, secreted the same immunoglobulin molecules. What he referred to blocking was actually the interaction of the antigen with these immunoglobulin molecules which he called side chains and it is the interaction of the antigen and these immunoglobulin side chains which triggered the immune response. Paul Ehrlich is considered a leading immunologist of that era. He was one of the early people to speculate about the nature of substances in the body which neutralize toxins and was referred to as antibody. So the word antibody itself was used by Ehrlich in 1897 probably for the first time. In a presentation before the Royal Society of Chemistry in 1900, Paul Eldish proposed that the cells have receptors which combine with the toxin, which is actually is an antigen. This binding releases the receptor molecules 
and neutralization of the toxin continues. In his model, he also tried to explain the action of complement, which in those days was actually called alexin. So as, as we have explained, in many ways, Eldritch's ideas were brilliantly precinct. The triggering of B lymphocytes does involve antigen binding to Ig receptor. It does lead to the release of immunoglobulin molecules. It does result in the lymphocyte making more of the same Ig receptors and it secretes them as antibodies. Eldritch also invoked cellular picture in explaining immune response for the first time. We have referred to Carl Landsteiner. Landsteiner can be called father of serology as he also discovered the blood group antigens and corresponding agglutinins. Blood transfusions today are possible because of his pioneering work. In 1901, Bordet and Gengu developed complement fixation test. Poons in the period 41-42 used immunofluorescence to show that both antigens and antibodies are present inside cells. Around the same time, Chase and Landsteiner showed the delayed higher sensitivity, a phenomena which is a part of the immune response in some situations was transferable via cells and not via serum. Medawa's group in 1953 demonstrated acquired immunological tolerance. In the subsequent years, identification and characterization of many cells and proteins associated with the immune system took place. In 1982-83 period, T-cell receptor isolation was reported and by then cell-mediated immunity was firmly accepted as one arm of the immune response. Perhaps no other area in biology has fetched so many Nobel Prizes as immunology. The list of the Nobel laureates in immunology can start with von Behring of Germany in 1901 for the work on serum therapy, especially its application against diphtheria. Metchnikov, who started that big debate, shared the Nobel Prize with Paul Eldich in 1908. Baldit for the discoveries relating to immunity actually for his discovery regarding complement was also awarded Nobel Prize 1919. Carl Landesteiner in 1930 was recognized for his discovery of human blood groups. McFarlane, Burnett and Medawar, former from Australia and Sir P. V. Medawar from Great Britain in 1960 shared the Nobel Prize for their discovery of acquired immunological tolerance. Edelman and Porter shared the Nobel Prize in 72 for having given insight into the chemical structure of antibodies. Rosalind Yellow getting the Nobel Prize for the development of radioimmunoassay. Benasareff, Dossett and Snell on the MHCs, 82, Sune, Bugstrom and Samuelson and Wen for their discoveries concerning prostaglandins, which are sort of indirectly involved in this area. Nice journey for his theories concerning the specificity in development and control of the immune system, who shared the Nobel Prize with Kohler and Meilestein for their discovery of the production of monoclonal antibodies. Susumoto Negawa from Japan, Murray and Thomas, Doherty and Zinker Nagel, S. B. Prusiner, Gunther Global 
for their discovery concerning signal hypothesis. And Bruce Butler, Jules Hoffman, and Ralph Marvin Stimen for his, their discovery of the dendritic cell and its role in adaptive immunity. Let us look at the contributions of a scientist whom we have referred to earlier called Niles Jernay. The contributions of Niles Jernay were actually very interesting. Niles Jernay was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1984 to quote for theories concerning the specificity in development of lymphocyte clonality and control of the immune system. It was actually Jernay's overview of the understanding of the immune system at that time which sort of crystallized the concept of clonal selection theory. Niles Jernay also initiated the concept of what we sometimes call as epitopes and more important the concept of idiotopes. Niles Jernay envisaged a network of epitopes and idiotopes. That is why his theory is called the network theory. So students, let us now summarize what we have learned in this specific module. What we have done is that we have looked at several milestones in the development of immunology which help us in understanding how the immune system number one distinguishes between self and non-self. It also has a memory. Thirdly, it can also react against unforeseen infectious agents. While earlier it was believed that antibodies alone were the key element of the immune response, the actual nature of the immune response turned out to be more complex. The preceding chronological account gives us some idea of this complexity. As we have briefly referred to, this history is riddled with some fierce debates and as we go along with the, our study of immunology, we will have an occasion to revisit some of these fierce debates. Thank you.